Another edition of Anti-Siphon Address Space Layout Randomization. Um, we are joined by our illustrious crew. We've got myself, we've got Chris, we've got uh, Jason, Serena, and Ryan. Um, once again, as always, this particular edition is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. If you need to get hacked, are afraid that you have been hacked, or you would like to not get hacked, call Black Hills Information Security for all of your hacking needs. And, and not also necessarily in that order. Not necessarily <laughs> in that order. Also, anti-siphon infosec training. We've got pay what you can training. Uh, it's kick-ass training that's actually affordable. So please check that out. And to that end, speaking of training, um, this particular ASLR episode, I am very, very honored to introduce you to Chris Brenton. And for those of you that may not know, Chris Brenton is an early mentor in my career. I believe that we met the summer in August of 2003. I yeah, know this right. because he was teaching in Denver while Blaster was spreading all over the place and he literally <laughs> dissected the entire thing live, which was absolutely awesome, got me hooked in the industry. And today's episode of ASLR, we are literally just going to hand it over to Chris and Chris is gonna do stupid, cool T-Shark tricks. Um, if you're not familiar with Chris's body of work, he has been a network ninja for a long, long time, um, has ran a number of classes dealing with firewalls, VPNs, perimeters, intrusion detection, and is also the COO of Active Countermeasures. So Chris, take it away, sir. What are you going to show us today, sir? Yeah. So, you know, speaking of anti-siphon, uh, some of this is kind of adjacent to what's going on in the uh, packet decoding class that I teach as part of that. But I wanted to kind of just play around with T-Shark today. Um, a lot of folks know Wireshark. They don't know T-Shark. T-Shark is basically the command line version of Wireshark. And you can do some really cool things with it. So I'm going to just kind of start basic. So the first switch I'm going to use with it is dash n. Don't try and resolve any IP addresses to fully qualified domain names. That just makes it a whole lot easier or uh, makes everything run a whole lot faster. And then I'm going to let dash r load up a pcap file. And then we'll just pump this through the less command so we can see what's there. And this is what your general output from T Shark looks like. So I can see, you know, which which frame was it inside the capture? What was the timestamp? Source IP, destination IP. Here's my transport. Notice I'm kind of getting some line wrap here, so it kind of all goes together and makes it hard to read. Uh, one of the things you can do to straighten that out is just to the dash s, uh, uh, do a dash capital S command at the end of less. And when I do that, oh hey look everything shows up in nice, pretty little columns, oh, which that makes is, it. That's way better. <laughs> Isn't that way better? <laughs> so better. I can live Thank with you. that. That's what everyone's going to take from this now. They're going to be oh. like pretty columns. That's Minus it. capital columns, S. I'm I'm that's it. I'm yep. done. Dash capital S. That's all you got to add to the less command. And it, it makes it into nice, pretty columns. Uh, you can page up, page down. The, you can see this stuff scrolled off to the right-hand side. I can just uh, right arrow over and get over to that stuff. Um, I've got a lot of Ethernet frame check sequence incorrect errors here. You may run into that on occasion if you're capturing packets that you're sending. Um, if you're capturing packets while you're trying to send them, um, the system will, it, it has to do with like where the CRC check gets generated. Um, if you ever want to get rid of those errors, I can go in and say, hey, I want to change this option, dash O, and the Ethernet check for SCS is usually set to true. Here you can just see I've set it to false. And when I go in and do that, oh, hey, look, all those nasty little frame errors go away. So I can see I've got a bunch of systems kind of communicating back and forth here. So one of the things I may want to go through and do is just get a look at, hey, who's talking to who the most often? Uh, it's a good way to go in and kind of look for port scans, look for command and control channels. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you may want to go through and hit that. Um, we can kind of see it here, who's talking to who, but we got a lot of data here that we may not necessarily care about. In other words, if all I care about is who's talking to who, the only things I really care about seeing is the source IP address and the destination IP address. One of the really cool things you can do with T-Shark that you can't do with like TCP dump and other tools is you can say, no, 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 don't print out that generic summary. I'm going to tell you exactly the fields I want to, I want to say. So notice I've added in a command here, dash capital T, that allows me to go in and specify what fields I want to look at. And this says, show me the source IP address. This says, show me the destination IP address. And then I'm just running it through the head command. So that'll show me 10 lines worth of output. That's what we got going on here. Now, remember, we're looking at raw packets. So this isn't like a unique session each way. What I'm actually looking at is the number of packets 
going in each direction. So one of the things I may want to do is go in and just look at, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, look at connection establishment. In other words, if I look at when was the TCP SYN flag turned on, that's just going to show me packets that we use to start a session, and that'll give me a better idea of what's actually uh, being generated for unique sessions between systems. So I'm still using that dash T fields command, still looking at source IP, destination IP. I got a display filter in here that I added in. I'm saying tcp.flags. So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying go to byte 13 in the TCP header. The lower six order bits, those are my TCP flags. If those six bits combined equals two, that's an interesting packet, and that's something I want to say. What's two? Well, two is the value of that section if the SYN flag is turned on and everything else is turned off. So effectively, what I'm looking for is first packet in a TCP session. Then I ran that through sort. So what the sort command here is doing is it's just saying, hey, anytime the source IP address and the destination IP address are the same, line them up one line after the other. And then I'm running it through unique-c. Unique-c says, OK, if there's 50 instances of one IP talking to another, compact that down to one line, but give me the number 50 to be able to tell me that there were 50 instances of that in there. It just It's going to allow me to count very quickly how many sessions there are. I dumped it through sort again. My sort-rn is saying, do a reverse sort. So instead of sorting lowest to highest, sort highest to lowest. And dash n says, don't, uh, this is a numeric value. It's not alphanumeric. So sort it like it's a number. And head dash five just says, hey, I only want to see the first five lines worth of output. So you can see my very first line here. I've got this system, 247.10, talking to 247.4. And there's about 10 times as many connections as I'm seeing on any of the other systems. So if I want to kind of focus in on who's generating the most number of sessions to who, that would probably be one of the ones I'd want to go in and take a look at first. Now, there's a problem here. And the problem is we're looking at how many, you know, who sent the, um, the greatest number of SYN packets to what IP address. Well, just because they sent a SYN doesn't mean that there was actually connection establishment, right? It doesn't mean data actually went anywhere. Um, I could send a SYN to, let's say, port 30. And if nothing's listening on port 30, that system will say, reset act, go away. There's nothing here listening on that port. You need to bother a different port or a different IP address. So what if I want to see these systems only when the connection was actually established? Well, instead of looking for a SYN packet, I could look for a SYN act. The way I could do that, TCP flags equals equals 18. Where's 18 coming from? Bit 16 is my ACK. Bit two is set. 16 plus two, hey, that gives me 18. So this is saying when the SYN flag is turned on and the ACK flag is turned on, that's interesting to me. Notice I also swapped destination IP and source IP versus what I did here. So think about it this way, right? My system, my server is over here. I send a SYN, a SYN ACK comes back. If I want to visually see who initialized the session on the left-hand side, I'm capturing the SYNAC packet, so I got to kind of swap, swap that source and destination. So now if I go in and run this, this will kind of show me uh, where, you know, which connections were actually successful between these two systems versus who may just be sending SYN packets. And you can see, yeah, my data is pretty much the same, right? And, my first and Chris, Yo. Tell me, so like the usefulness on this, if I'm reading it right, I want to make sure I got it right, is we see, like, let's say something gets compromised in the inside of the network, but it's trying to communicate to a C2 server that is deny listed in the firewall. It's trying to make the connection again and again and again, but it's not actually establishing the connection. Correct me if I'm correct. wrong, this is correct. helping you identify that no, this actually made a connection all the way through, correct? Correct, so if I look in the uh, my first line of output, I can see 247.3, 12 times sent a SYN packet to 247.4. Well, if I look at the output down here, that entry is gone. So what mm -hmm. that tells me is those 12 SYN packets went to some port that that system wasn't actually listening on. Now, this or looks like being dropped somewhere in the middle, like a firewall, maybe. It, it, exactly. I mean, these two IPs are one right after the other on the same subnet. So I'm assuming I'm kind of looking at the subnet and maybe I got a communication problem here. Uh, but yeah, if it was two different subnets, it could be a firewall in the way. 
uh, something is something is or like I said, that system just isn't listening on that port. So what's coming back is not a SYNAC, but a reset act. Yeah. <clears throat> Making sense. This reminds yeah. me of a uh, cool. Spanish class. Yeah, like where they're like, here's a bunch of words. And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, eventually, eventually it will make sense. But, yeah. Well, so, you know, we were talking about resets. They're actually kind of interesting to look at, too. I like resets because it's an indication of something went wrong. Either yeah. somebody tried to connect to a port that was closed or something went wrong with a session. So, you know, again, I can go in and I can do my display filter to say TCP dot flags equals equals four. Four is the reset bit. So what I'm going in and I'm saying here is show me any packets that have the reset flag turned on. And now this will come back and this will tell me, OK, this is who's sending resets to who. Now, typically what that's an indication of is someone, you know, this system sent a packet to this one that it wasn't happy with. And that's why that system sent the reset back to the other. And um, okay, so this also brings up an interesting thing. Like when you're looking at the TCP flags and the values that are being set, you know, there's been people in the industry that are like, oh, we don't need to know the TCP IP header anymore. But ah. if, you really, if you really <laughs> want to dig, right, and you want to be effective, you kind of need to understand these flags a little bit, right? Right, right. So for example, like one of the things is we're looking at TCP, the only TCP flag being turned on is the reset flag. That should never really happen. Uh, the yeah. only time it should happen is if I'm like sending a fin packet to an open port or something where, no, this is just horribly wrong. So the fact that we've got any in here at all kind of says we've got some weird communication taking place on the network because and, and typically me, what you'll get back is a reset act. Yeah. And for me, looking at this, you know, as an attacker, we do that type of, you know, reset type scanning. Uh, sometimes. So we'll, yep. we'll use that, right? So you're right. I can't think of something where it's totally legit that this would stand up and be like, yeah, this totally makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I was, you know, so as we were just saying, reset turned on by itself, that's kind of odd. Usually it's going to be a reset act. So how do I get to see a reset act? Well, I could have gone in and said, you know, reset for act uh, 16, so TCP dot flags equals equals 20. But if I did that, I'd just be showing you the same filter again. I wanted to also show you that you can actually call out the flag you're interested in. Oh, and this will just and, and this will automatically ignore everything else. So this could be a Christmas tree scan with all the flags turned on, and it doesn't care. It's just so we looking, a, just looking so we at this a, one flag. Cool. We had a question from uh, I'm going to pronounce I mispronounce this name, Lamille Velo. Uh, so, so you can ping with reset to see if that system is alive. Is that correct? So um, actually that's not correct because no. RFC state thou shalt not respond to an error packet. A reset packet is considered an error packet. So you should never respond to a re because otherwise it's kind of like the systems are in New Jersey, you know, reset. Yeah. Oh, reset me. Well, reset you too. You yeah, know, it goes it, back and we forth. don't want the internet going that way. So. so there's a handful of situations where you're not supposed to respond, right? You're not supposed to respond to errors. You're not supposed to respond to packets that have an invalid TCP checksum as well. So, yep. I like this. Uh, damn, Chris, where were you when I was taking my GCIA? This is way easier than LOL. I love yeah. White Cider Duck. No comment. Yeah. So, so in this instance here, I'm just looking at the reset flag. One means it's turned on. Zero means it's turned off. So I'm going in and saying, hey, look for the reset flag turned on. Ignore all the other flags. I don't care about those. I don't care what the status is of those. And then the sort unique sort that I did before. Notice now that I'm looking for reset act, we've got very different data than what we got when we were looking for reset set by itself, right? 560 plus instances. And now, you know, we talked about these should not be New Jersey based systems. They should not be resetting back and forth. And yet I can see. This system sent 168 resets to this one, and that one responded with 561 resets. No, no, something's really, really wrong here. If I look at my second two entries, I get the same thing. 136 instances of one system sending a reset to one and another one sending a reset back. Oh, no, that should not be happening. So, so again, one of the things I like about resets is something is horribly wrong here. Maybe it's a security issue. 
maybe it's an IT or a networking issue. But either way, something's wrong and is worth paying attention to. Cool. So that's some of the flag stuff. A uh, quick um, question. Is a New Jersey-based system where it's located or slang for something that's going wrong with a system? Oh. <laughs> they start fighting with each other for no good reason. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, so it, it's kind of that New York, New Jersey thing where, you know, you say a slur to me, I say a slur back at you, you know. So I was kind of using that in the context of reset right. packets. It's a okay. thing. Yeah, because for a moment I was like, "How did you know the system was based in?" Georgia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's well, doing the reset. Maybe the we'll reset you too. Yeah, yeah. You got all the IP addresses memorized. Him and Chuck yes. to hang it's out. Good and golly, yeah. Shire. And the ones I don't right. know off the top of my head, Stearns knows. So <laughs> that's why we keep him around. That is. Yeah. Awesome. So. Well, all right. No, that's awesome. So that's kind of a really nice kind of. This is the way you can do some level of filtering. Um, from the command line. And the thing I love about this is you can do these filters, right? And you can do it from the command line. And instead of just being stuck within the ecosystem of Wireshark, yep. all of a sudden you can bring all of Bash to the party, right? You bring yeah. Sort, you bring Unique, uh, you bring Head. And uh, that's just, that's like really cool because it opens up your toolbox as far as what you can do. Mm. And so I want to be clear before I like trigger haters. I don't hate Wireshark. Wireshark is a really good tool. Um, but every tool has something it's strong at, and it's kind of a bummer in other things. Um, so there's, there are times when T-Shark actually makes a better tool. Like, hey, all I cared about was who was talking to who. Trying to get this out of Wireshark and get it out of it accurately is really hard. Well, I know your T-Shark uh, blogs have done really well over the years for active kind of measures because people, you know, they find it. <laughs> uh, but John, you talk I know, about I know I refer back to them all the time, so... <laughs> There was a moment you talked about everyone coming to the party like Bash and Head, and, and I just feel like they should be characters, and we should actually have a real party where they all come and hang out with T-shirts. Right. But we yeah. need that to happen. That's another T-shirt or a comic. Mm -hmm. um, so there we go. Yep. Yeah. It, the uh, advanced threat hunting class that I teach through Annie Siphon, you know, I kind of teach folks early on, your mantra is sort, unique, sort. Yeah. Because well, so much of this stuff, you're running it through sort, then unique, and then sort at the end. You, you talk about, Bill... Um, and I was running into this last week and I did sort unique sort and I, I felt dirty. Like there has to be a more efficient way than using sort twice. And Bill was like, no, John, it's fine. That happens all the time. It's totally yep. the way it works. And that was pretty cool. All right. Yeah. So now we got the second one. Oh, yeah. So, hey, so uh, I figured out where the ASN is coming out. It's out of uh, at and out of Washington, DC. So I don't know if that's... That up. I, I like that's true. These are the types of people we like to party with, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I mentioned there's some things you can do with T-Shark that you can't do with Wireshark. So let's kind of look at an example of that. Um, so here you can see I've got one system pinging another, right? So we've got an echo request, an echo reply, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But they're kind of weird, right? One of our rules when we ping things is that whatever was in the payload, needs to be reflected back. back. Yeah, and the echo reply. Yeah. So if I had a 56-bit echo request, I would expect a 56 to come back, regardless of what that other operating system happens to be. So the fact that this is changing is kind of weird. Now, the only time it might be different and it's not actually a payload issue is if, let's say, the, the larger packet had IP options turned on. Right. There could be like record route turned on or something like that. That might I, explain why it's a little bit. I don't think we see that that much anymore, do we? Um, we yeah, we, well, it, it will, except for the folks who go through my class, because there's actually yeah. some cool things you can do with that. Yeah. But it would also, uh, T-Shark would show us that. It would show us that the record route was option was turned on or the loose source routing option was turned on or whatever the case may be. And we don't see that in the output. So this is definitely the payload sizes are different, which is kind of weird. So I'm just going to kind of page through these a little bit. Whoa, oh, whoa. Oh. yeah, what happened here? So we've got a 56 echo request, a 42 echo reply, a 56 echo request, and then that 42 jumps to 46. There's an extra four bits in there for some reason. Hmm, that's kind of odd. And then that causes my echo request to jump up to 160. Huh. 
So something's going on in the payload here, clearly, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that would be really cool is if I could follow this TCP stream. Oh, wait, Wireshark does that, right? I can go into Wireshark. I can go in and I can say, follow. Oh, wait, I have a TCP option, UDP, DCCP. So those are my only transports that are supported. These are all application level. I don't have an ICMP option. I can follow TCP. And when you follow TCP, if, you know, for anybody who hasn't played with this before, oh, you got to use this. Because what this is showing me is what traffic is going in what direction. And it just takes all the packets and kind of combines them all together, which is kind of cool. It makes this really easy to read. So this is an awesome tool that I like to use a lot. But like we said, there's no follow ICMP. So if I know something weird's going on here in the payload, but I can't stream that out, what do I do? Well, luckily, one of the things I can do is I can actually stream that out with T Shark. Let me show you what I mean. <clears throat> so we're going to go in and we're going to say T Shark dash N, don't resolve IPs, dash R, read this PCAP file, dash T fields. So remember, that allows us to specify what fields we want to say. I'm saying the field I want to see is dash E, the data field. And then I'm creating a display filter that says data dot data, only show me the data. Now I could have just said, put that at the end, but then I couldn't show you, oh, hey, look, you can do display filters with dash capital Y too. Multiple ways mm -hmm. to do the same thing. Sometimes it's fun to have one versus another. So what's this do for me? Well, let's go through and let's just kind of look at what this output looks like, right? I'm just gonna pump this through head dash 20 and we're gonna take a look at what that looks like. And notice what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Here is all of my payloads, the hex output from those. Cool. Uh, where's Judy Novak when you need her? <laughs> yeah, really, right? <laughs> oh, and I got a loop going here. Lucky me. All right. So that goes through and that gives me hex output, right? Wouldn't it be nice if this was in ASCII? Well, one of my Linux command line tools is XXD. XXD takes ASCII characters, converts them to hex. So what I'm going to say is XXD dash R, I want you to do it in reverse. So instead of going from ASCII to hex, I want to go from hex to ASCII. And then I'm going to say dash P, I want to print that out as plain text. And then we're going to do our wonderful la less dash uh, capital S command. So what this is going to do is take all of those oh, ICMP oh. payloads and string them all together. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now, now, remember that when we saw the change in the size, right, we went from 42 to 46 bytes. So we said there was an extra four bytes that went by, and then all of a sudden things got weird. Well, look at my first line, D-I-R, enter. Oh, that's four characters. <laughs> so the system sending the replies, the echo replies, embedded D-I-R in it, it mirrored that back like it was a terminal running over echo request, echo reply packets. And oh, hey, look what came out of the system sending the echo request. Here's the contents of my temp directory. Hmm. Oh, hey, look, here's what happens when you run task list. What, what is this? This is a command and control channel that's running over ICMP. But we were able to reassemble the, by reassembling the payloads. We can clearly see this. But like I said, with Wireshark, yeah, no, there's no ICMP follow option. You can't do it here. So if you've got ICMP that you need to reassemble and you can't do it in Wireshark, here's how to go through and do it in T Shark. Awesome. So that felt like in a mystery movie when they were like, and I, the gun belongs to. <laughs> 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 it's, it, it, it's the prestige, right? Like, yeah. you know, uh, you, you have the different steps of a magic trick, right? And then boom, the prestige. Here's, yes. here's the files on your system. So, yep. awesome. well, yeah. It's like really interesting because we were just talking about uh, DNS and then I had made that video of DNS tunneling um, and sending information through DNS to command and control. And I didn't know you could do that with ICMP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Great. That. <laughs> so, so, so John mentioned we've been at this for a while. Um, one of the things <laughs> I did in a past life was back when you know Y two K was all a thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, oh God, 
The I government. Are like, water. Some people are like, we weren't born yet, Chris. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know yeah, exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Fine, keep but, going. But um, one of the things the government was worried about was not so much Y2K, they didn't have a big enough date space, but who would actually try and leverage that to attack systems and try and make it look like it's a Y2K bug when it's actually somebody breaking in. Um, and as part of this team, I detected a command and control channel running over ICMP echo, uh, or excuse me, error packets. Uh, I think it was host unreachable packets that were going by. Um, that was, so, you know, can you do this over ICMP? Oh yeah, this was actually the first C2 channel I ever found in the wild was one yeah. running over ICMP error packets. And somebody, um, we had Anytime uh, Chunker asked, what are some C2s that do this? Um, Loki was probably one of the first ones that was yep. widespread a long time ago. And another one is Nishang, um, is a full PowerShell-based um, ICMP um, like uh, backdoor. And our backdoor testing tool for C2 that Bill does, does it, does it do ICMP too? I can't remember um, <laughs> out of all the things that he does on that one. So he, he was uh, using a version based on – so what Bill was using to create the uh, data was Netcat. And oh. Netcat does not create ICMP. So what Bill literally just modified and put in my inbox this morning was a version based on HPing 3 that will do ICMP uh, tunnels. I need to test it and vet it before we release it in the wild. Okay, so, cool. So yeah, the, the, the beacon testing tool um, oh. doesn't support it today, but probably will by next week. Now, another yeah. interesting thing about ICMP and malformed ICMP packets, um, that is usually one of the first rules that security teams disable. Um, yeah. Because anytime <laughs> yep. you, get a, you get a malformed <laughs> ICMP packet, there's a ton of legacy rules um, that uh, you know, deal with things like Loki and things of that nature. Um, but there's also old vulnerabilities like EtherLeak where you used to be able to leak memory contents off of systems yes. um, by sending malformed <laughs> ICMP packets. So what my point is, ICMP as a rule set for IDS systems tends to be very noisy, and many organizations just shut it off, and it creates a blind spot for them. Yeah. Well, no, you, know, you, you don't get that alert anymore, so it's no longer a problem. Yeah. And once again, anytime, Chonker, we're not saying Wireshark needs to up its game, right? Remember, these are a lot of the same developers the use case is very different between these two separate tools. Um, it's not that one is better or worse than the other. Well, so they're, they're both actually part of the same tool set. So mm -hmm. Wireshark and T-Shark is the same code base. The difference is because T-Shark is command line based, I can manipulate the tool in a way that the developers didn't think of. Right. So it's clear from Wireshark, they never thought about reassembling ICMP streams. Why would anybody ever need to do that? It's a stateless, you know, stateless protocol. Well, because they gave me an option to do that in ICMP, you know, we're able to go through and kind of hit this now. So, yeah, it's just, you know, all a matter of what you're into. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Rancid X64, thanks for following. Coffee Addicts, thanks for following. PJ Sill, Sliney, thanks for following. Blood Knight One, thanks for following. Uh, we are um, members. If you follow us, Jason has to try to pronounce your your name. Yeah, so yes, be sure. be sure to follow. So him. make a second account with an even crazier account. name <laughs> and yeah. have Jason pronounce it. The worst <laughs> is the worst is when I like pronounce a name and I'm like, oh, sorry, I I really butchered your username, and they're like, it's my real name. Oh, <laughs> my real name. That's Thank you very name. much, Mister. A man to hug and kiss. A man to <laughs> hug and kiss. And I so, no. If I can just hit one more real quick, because yep, it was brought up, you can do this over DNS. So, um, you know, so here's some DNS traffic, right? We got a lot of queries taking place here. One of the things, again, I can do with T Shark is I can say, just show me what I care about. So I can go in and I can say dash T fields, show me just the DNS query names. And if I go in and do that, hmm. Those are some weird names, aren't they? I mean, this is not what I would ever choose to name a system. <laughs> I'm sure most people here are kind of feeling the same way. That's the website I get all my medication from. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that might be a problem. Um, so. Yep. Now, notice I got some blank lines in here. The blank lines are simply because um, not every packet is going to be a DNS query. So anytime a packet is checked, but it doesn't have this field in it, T-Shark just prints out a blank line. One of the things I can do to get rid of that is just go in and say grep-v 
anything that's a blank line. And then once I do that, where'd you go? Here we go. That's what I wanted. Now that I do that, hey, here's all my queries one after another. Now we were just, yeah, we we're just talking about hex. Notice anything interesting about the host portion of this? There's actually, so if I'm looking at this, there's actually some repeating portions of it. That's interesting. Yeah, and it's numeric and A through F. Hmm, what uses numbers in A through F? <laughs> so one of the things we might want to do, yeah, this looks like hex. So one of the things we may want to do is cut this portion out so we just have the hex and only the hex. Well, I can go in and I can use cut for that. So here's my grep dash V getting rid of the blank lines. And then I'm saying cut dash D period. My period is my delimiter between fields. And I'm saying dash F1, just give me the first field. And when I go through and do that, that cuts off the domain name portion of it and just gives me the host. Cool. So now I've got that hex. Well, now I can go through and I can leverage XXD again to go through and try and decode. What is that hex? Is there anything hidden in there for a message? And when I go through and do that, oh, oh hey, look, uh -oh. <laughs> default gateway. Oh, this looks like IP config type setups. VM net one. Yeah, that's usually an interface we're all going to have if we're running VMware for uh, running VMs. Uh, there's some more data that needs to get cleaned up here, obviously. Uh, who I'm am I? I think you're getting a lot of terminal garbage coming coming in. If I'm oh, yeah, agreed. Correctly. For a second, okay. I thought you were summoning a demon or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, God, no. Chris, stop, 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 stop. stop. <laughs> yes. But notice, like, it looks like they tried to run the who, I, who am I command, and that was successful, and that produced some additional data. Um, they, they CD'd into the downloads directory, and I start seeing a bunch of file names. This is another command and control channel running over DNS. Now, what happens if you pipe that through strings? Does it help clean it up a little bit? Uh, let's find out. Yeah, I don't know what it's going to do with some of those other characters. No, nope, those characters. Yeah. It was printing those characters the same. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> oh, <wee. laughs> oh, wow. That is so cool. But still, it's enough to let you know at this point, <laughs> you have badness on your network. Like, yes. <laughs> this is a bad day, right? Yes. Now. When you see DNS queries leaving your environment that clearly have command sets in them, you're having a bad day. But yeah. again, this is something that's really easy to go in and kind of tag with T-Shark. So. Oh, that is so cool. All right. So that's the three. Um, and oh, so and oh, just, oh, just one last comment is that I pulled that out of DNS query, but the, I could pull that out of any field. So if like oh. the CRC is being used to embed information, dash E, pull out that CRC, recode it the way you need to. Wow, that's cool. Somebody had mentioned, um, they said, where can we learn more about this? And then we posted in a link to your uh, free network threat hunting class, um, which I thought was pretty good. That yeah, the, uh, oh. so, so this type of content is probably more uh, the pay what you want, pack a decoding class that I do. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So now at the end, we really like to get the tech out of the way up front because there's a bunch of really impatient people that are doing <laughs> do-it-yourself crap on YouTube. And they're like, I just get, get to the point, man. I don't want to hear knock, knock and fart jokes. So we get those out of the way. We get the tech out of the way. Now it's open for questions. Um, so uh, if anybody that's listening on, um, on Twitch or Discord or Restream or wherever we're at, um, has any questions, now's the time to just kind of ask Chris anything. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people, I think, that, you know, they don't see this. You know, and this gets into something, you know, old dudes lament all the time, is a lot of people that are getting started in this industry, they don't bother to learn the basics and fundamentals of these things. And uh, Frackery, we're going to get you a link to the packet decoding, decoding course. And that is a pay which you can. Yep. Um, a lot of our stuff questions. anti siphon Oh, yeah, go ahead, Serena. Okay, for your packet decoding class and the other one that we posted that six hour threat hunting training, what mm -hmm. do you recommend coming in with like prerequisite knowledge? So for the packet decode, um, you need a basic understanding of IP and how things communicate on the network. Um, you don't need like an in-depth knowledge like we were using here, that's what the class is for. But you at least, you know, if I, you know, 
told you one system pinged another, you should kind of understand what that reference is. If you don't, then yeah, you may need to do a little bit of work before walking into that class. The advanced threat hunting class, um, that one is more geared towards, I've been doing security for a while and what I'm doing doesn't seem to really be working. I need some better ideas on how to figure out when somebody's compromised an internal system. And, and that's for me, like, just so you all know, I still sit in on Chris's class periodically um, and watch this stuff because I'm still learning uh, all the time. And I, I think that a lot of people in the industry today, you know, we've been fronted so much by vendors and abstracted so yes. much <laughs> from what's happening. But the problem with that is many times people don't even know what types of questions they can ask. Uh, from packets. They don't know what's actually there. It's it's this black magic thing and their automatic tool decodes a whole bunch of stuff for them. And they don't even know what's the, the it's a limit of the imagination because they don't know what's possible. I, I think some of it is also too, you need to stop and ask yourself, hey, this recommendation I'm getting from the vendor, if I implement that, will it cause them to make more money off of me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because if it does, there might be a bias there. I mean, that's one of the nice things about, you know, the webcasts we do, any, any siphon and all of that is, you know, John and I have no agenda beyond point out the stupidness and help everybody lock their networks down. We're not trying to sell anything. So, yeah. And by the way, a hacksaw 786 asked, where does one learn the fundamentals? Plural site? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can go to plural site, Udemy, you can go to, yep. um, you can go to YouTube. Um, and a lot of our stuff at Anti-Siphon, and I'm going to disagree with Chris. Um, when I first got started in computer security way back in 2003, okay, I didn't understand very much of this at all. I was a snot-nosed punk that knew how to write buffer overflow attacks when we didn't have address-based layout randomization, which, by the way, Dr. Watson did 90% of the work for you back yeah. then, okay? And I'm going to encourage you to check it out and take his class because it's going to make you stretch and it's going to get you there much faster than trying to find some basics and fundamentals. We do cover some basics and fundamentals of TCP IP and like Wireshark and TCP dump, really, really basic stuff in the in intro to sock pay what you can class as well. But like I said, I strongly encourage you go check out the class from Chris. Yes. Some basic understanding helps. But, you know, you're not learning if it doesn't hurt just a little. <laughs> yeah. For the uh, networking stuff, too, there's always free courses that are given away on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. But also, if you just look at, like, if you don't know where to start, and I think that's part of the problem, is people are like, okay, networking. But they have no idea, like, where to yeah. actually start with that and what that all includes. Um, look at like the network plus, like even if you don't take the cert, just look at what's on the cert and those topics and yeah. kind of just start yeah. diving in from there so that you actually know like things to Google or like yeah. what's gonna be relevant <laughs> to know. Um, and I always kind of recommend that. Like I said, even if you don't take the cert, just look to see what's on there, their yeah. topics and you can start start there. I'm gonna, yeah, it, and this is going to get into something that's going to might get me into trouble. The vast majority of security training classes, if you look <laughs> at their outline, almost 100% of the class is available online somewhere. So mm -hmm. just remember yeah. that. Chris, we got somebody that just pointed out, um, anytime Chonker said, I think based on what you've just shown here, I could script something to detect both types of C2. And I think that that's a good start, right? Like yeah. I want to bring you back as, as you know, you know, stupid, awesome T-shark tricks. But this is the beginning. <laughs> this is building. Like in your class, you actually show people how to build like full-on detection of this stuff too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, so some of what I do, you know, like I, I'll have folks sit in class and say, you know, Chris, I could have done that in half amount of space with Python. And absolutely you can. But what I try to do is teach the concepts in a way that anybody can kind of grab onto it. So like, yeah, I mentioned HPing before. Uh, HPing 3 is a great tool to get used to how do you craft packets? How do you create your own packets that you want to spit out on the wire? Scapy is far more extensive, but if you don't have a Python background, it's going to be, you're going to have a real hard time understanding Scapy. So I like mm -hmm. to kind of use the basic tools that everybody can go in and get started with. But, you know, as far as being able to like script things out, um, yeah, one I was kind of playing around with uh, doing beacon detection within, um, within Zeke logs is this. 
and this is something I kind of get into in the classes. Basically, what this will do is you can run beacon dash plot and give it two IP addresses uh, that are within Zeek data that are in the current directory. And it's going to go through and plot out how many times did each IP address connect to each other each hour over a 24 hour period of time. And, you know, if you're, you're familiar with command and control and how it works, they're persistent connections, meaning, you know, the compromise system is constantly calling out to that command and control server saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? I'm sitting here bored. What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and that allows you to, like, catch patterns like that. Um, the weird goal I had with this was to go through and use at least 10 different tools. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. Now, I, I uh, just realized I'm a... Oh, what's I, that, Jason? Sorry, I just realized I'm a command and control channel, just calling out, is there anything you need me to do? Just, yeah. Is there yep. anything you need me to do? Yep. Sounds like, anything sounds anything? like me on my days off bugging my wife. Hey, do you need anything? <laughs> you need to go get a life that doesn't involve BHIS. Um, yeah, and, and I was going to say, since when do you get days off? Oh, my God. Um, around Christmas, I took one and it sucked. Yeah. Uh, well, well actually, I was going to say getting them and taking them are two different things. Two different things. WhiteCyberDoc asked, is C2 over DNS and ICMP, does it produce a responsive terminal? And I'm going to say yes and no. Yes, um, it, it is when you're working with it. It depends on the frequency of the communication. The faster the communication, the more responsive it is. But it also means it's more detectable. So you've got this balance as, a, as an attacker. And also for data transfer, for large files, it can be somewhat frustrating to try to transfer large files. But by the nature of DNS... It's and ICMP, it's stimulus response. ICMP yep. echo request, ICMP echo response. DNS request, DNS response. So it does work pretty well um, for that. And it's a matter of how good of a job can you do at hiding it? Because, you know, so for yeah. example, this last one we were looking at, the data is hidden in the DNS query. So how yeah. would you detect that? Well, you need to log your DNS queries. Most of us don't. And if you just looked at it as a raw traffic level, what are you going to say? Oh, my DNS server was a little busier than it usually is. Is anybody really going to flag that? Probably not. So awesome. yeah, some of this stuff can be kind of subtle. So I just got something from Sombrero. Uh, Sombrero said, I'm starting as an IT intern in a couple of weeks. What should I focus on learning right now to be successful in my role? I just got my permission thanks to Jason's job hunting plan, which is awesome. <laughs> Sombrero, we're going to reach out to you on Discord, and uh, Jason will get your contact information, and I'm going to get you a free uh, license for the on-demand version of Intro to SOC um, and Intro to Security, because I want you, if you came up through Jason and all that, I'm going to try to set you up the best I can. Um, so we'll get you access to the on-demand version of those two intro classes. Start there and then move into Chris's stuff. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think there's kind of two stages to that, right? There's the, the first thing you should learn is what your boss expects you to know. Yep. That should be the first thing right out of the gate. After start, that, yeah. figure out what your passion is. You know? Yep. And you're starting in a couple of weeks. So take advantage of this time to learn the fundamentals. You really need to learn the fundamentals. Yeah, because yeah, it is like how Jason was saying, it is a different language. So sometimes, you know, I remember my first job out of college, I was working on servers and I had a background in you know, just like campus networking. And so they were talking about a lot of virtualization and concepts. And I was sitting there, I was like, I don't know what you're saying because I don't know these <laughs> words. Word. Yep. Um, and so it is just like becoming familiar with a lot of the terminology and acronyms. And eventually over time, I was able to sit in the meetings and contribute because <laughs> I knew the words then. Um, I, but yeah, just even getting familiar with the terminology could be helpful, even if it's not very specific to what your job's going to be. I uh, I had a nuclear physicist that was from it was a professor at MIT that was um, coming into um, that was coming into security, and she said she hated this industry. And I'm like, well, you're, you're a nuclear physicist. Like, how hard can this be? And she's like, you have so many acronyms, so many terms. <laughs> All of your tools run with completely different switches. Windows is completely different from Linux. And she's like, really, it seems like computer security is more like this arcane magic where you're tying in all of this different IT stuff that's all disparate and it's all weird. And it can be very, very intimidating to get started. And I can, I think I can kind of understand that, even though it's the only world I know. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
a friend of mine got out the acronym book and then there was an acronym within the acronym. So like when you expanded out the acronym, there was actually an acronym within the acronym that expanded out. And I was like, <laughs> I well, Hey Jason, have I told you about my sock socks with Rock'em Sock'em Robots? <laughs> we'll make your sock socks. All right. Sombrero, thanks for following. Hacksaw786, thanks for following. Uh, X Deadly GG, thanks for following. And Sombrero, go ahead and send me an email. We'll, 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 we'll get hook you something you nice. Yeah, yeah, Jason, if he's already taken the sock class, give him a free uh, seat in mine. Check I got no problem with that. that. Cool. Appreciate that. All right, everybody. That's 45 minutes. Um, like we said, we're trying to keep this. Um, dense we're trying to keep this very <laughs> thank you trying to keep uh, it dense that's why i'm here yes yeah. um, we're trying to keep it dense with the technical stuff we really appreciate you all coming and hanging out and um you know like subscribe or whatever it is that people do but tell your friends uh we're trying to share as much knowledge as we possibly can because that is ultimately the charter of everyone that you see on the screen right now so yeah. that's it all right kill Bye. it